A Bit of Wood by Algernon Blackwood He found himself in Meran with some cousins who had various slight ailments, but being rich and imaginative, had gone to a sanatorium to be cured. But for its sanatoria, Meran might be a cheerful place. Their ubiquity reminds a healthy man too often that the air is really good. Being well enough himself, except for a mental worries, he went to a guest house in the neighborhood. In the sanatorium, his cousins complained bitterly of the food, the ignorant sisters, the inattentive doctors, and the idiotic regulations generally, which proves that people should not go to a sanatorium unless they are really ill. However, they paid heavily for being there, so felt that something was being accomplished, and were annoyed when he called each day for tea and told them cheerfully how much better they looked, which proved, again, that their ailments were slight and quite curable by the local doctor at home. With one of the ailing cousins, a rich and pretty girl, he believed himself in love. It was a three weeks' business, and he spent his mornings walking in the surrounding hills, his mind reflective, analytical, and ambitious, as with a man in love. He thought of thousands of things. He mooned. Once, for instance, he paused beside a rivulet to watch the buttercups dip and asked himself, Will she be like this when we're married, so anxious to be well that she thinks, fearfully all the time, of getting ill? For if so, he felt he would be bored. He knew himself accurately enough to realize that he could never stand that. Yet money was a wonderful thing to have, and he, already thirty-five, had little enough. Am I influenced by her money, then, he asked himself, and so went on to ask and wonder about many things besides, for he was of a reflective temperament, and his father had been a minor poet. And doubt crept in. He felt a chill. He was not much of a man, perhaps thin-blooded, and unsuccessful, rather a dreamer, too, into the bargain. He had one hundred pounds a year, of his own, and a position, in a philanthropic institution, due to influence, with a nominal salary attached. He meant to keep the latter after marriage. He would work just the same. Nobody should ever say that of him. And as he sat on the fallen tree beside the rivulet, idly kicking stones into the rushing water with his stick, he reflected upon those banal truisms that epitomize two-thirds of life. The way little, unimportant things can change a person's whole existence was the one just now his thought had fastened on. His cousin's chill and headache, for instance, caught at a gloomy picnic on the Campania three weeks before, had led to her going into a sanatorium, and being advised that her heart was weak, that she had a tendency to asthma, that gout was in her system, and that a treatment of x-rays, radium, sun baths, and light baths, violet rays, no meat, complete rest, with big daily fees to experts with European reputations, were imperative. From that chill, sitting a moment too long, in the shadow of a forgotten patrician's tomb, he reflected, has come all this. All this, including his doubt as to whether it was herself or her money that he loved, whether he could stand living with her always, whether he need really keep his work on after marriage, in a word, his entire life and future, and her own as well, all from that tiny chill three weeks ago, and he knocked with his stick a little piece of sawn-off board that lay beside the rushing water. Upon that bit of wood, his mind, his mood, then fastened itself. It was triangular, a piece of sawn-off wood, brown with age and ragged. Once it had been a part of a triumphant, hopeful sapling on the mountains. Then, when thirty years of age, the men had cut it down. The rest of it stood somewhere now at this very moment in the walls of a house. This extra bit was cast away as useless. It served no purpose anywhere. 
It was slowly rotting in the sun, but each tap of the stick, he noticed, turned it sideways without sending it over the edge into the rushing water. It was obstinate. It doesn't want to go in, he laughed, his father's little talent cropping out in him. But by Jove it shall. And he pushed it with his foot, but again it stopped, stuck endways against a stone. He then stooped, picked it up, and threw it in. It plopped and splashed, and went scurrying away downhill with the bubbling water. Even that scrap of useless wood, he reflected, rising to continue his aimless walk and still idly dreaming, even that bit of rubbish may have a purpose and may change the life of someone, somewhere. And then went strolling through the fragrant pines, crossing a dozen similar streams and hitting scores of stones and scraps and fir cones as he went, till he finally reached his guest house an hour later, and found a note from her. We shall expect you about three o'clock. We thought of going for a drive. The others feel so much better. It was a revealing touch, the way she put it on the others. He made his mind up then and there. Thus tiny things divide the course of life, that he could never be happy with such an affected creature. He went for that drive, sat next to her consuming beauty, proposed to her passionately on the way back, was accepted before he could change his mind, and is now the father of several healthy children, and just as much afraid of getting ill, or of their getting ill, as she was fifteen years before. The female, of course, matures long, long before the male, he reflected, thinking the matter over in his study once. And that scrap of wood he idly set in motion, out of impulse, also went its destined way upon the hurrying water that never dared to stop. Proud of its newfound motion, it bobbed down merrily, spinning and turning for a mile or so, dancing gaily over sunny meadows, brushing the dipping buttercups as it passed, through vineyards, woods, and under dusty roads, in neat, cool gutters, and tumbling headlong over little waterfalls, until it neared the plain, and so finally it came to a wooden trough that led off some of the precious water to a sawmill where bare-armed men did practical and necessary things. At the parting of the ways its angles delayed it for a moment, undecided which way to take. It wobbled, and upon that moment's wobbling hung tragic issues, issues of life and death. Unknowing, yet assuredly not unknown, it chose the trough. It swung light-heartedly into the tearing sluice. It whirled with a gush of water towards the wheel, banged, spun, trembled, caught fast in the side where the cogs just chanced to be, and abruptly stopped the wheel. At any other spot, the pressure of the water must have smashed it into pulp, and the wheel have continued as before. But it was caught in the one place where the various tensions held it fast, immovably. It stopped the wheel, and so the machinery of the entire mill. It jammed like iron. The particular angle at which the double-handed saw, held by two weary, perspiring men, had cut it off a year before, just enabled it to fit and wedge itself with irresistible exactitude. The pressure of the tearing water, combined with the weight of the massive wheel, to fix it tight and rigid, and in due course a workman, it was the foreman of the mill, came from his post inside to make investigations. He discovered the irritating item that caused the trouble. He put his weight in a certain way. He strained his hefty muscles. He swore, and the scrap of wood was easily dislodged. He fished the morsel out and tossed it on the bank and spat on it. The great wheel started with a mighty groan, but it started a fraction of a second before he expected it would start. He overbalanced, clutching the revolving framework with a frantic effort, shouted, swore, leaped at nothing, and fell into the pouring flood. In an instant he was turned upside down, sucked under, drowned. He was engaged to be married, and had put by a thousand cronen.
in the Tiroler Sparbank. He was a sober and hard-working man. There was a paragraph in the local paper two days later, the Englishman asking the porter of his guest house for something to wrap up a present he was taking to his cousin in the sanatorium, used that very issue. As he folded its crumpled and recalcitrant sheets with sentimental care about the precious object, his eye fell carelessly upon the paragraph. Being of an idle and reflective temperament, he stopped to read it. It was headed Ungluck's Fall, and his poetic eye, inherited from his foolish rhyming father, caught the pretty expression, Flies und Wasser. He read the first few lines. Some fellow with a picturesque Tyrolese name had been drowned beneath a mill wheel. He was popular in the neighborhood, it seemed. He had saved some money and was just going to be married. It was very sad. Our reader's sympathy was with him, and, being of a reflective temperament, the Englishman thought for a moment while he went on wrapping up the parcel. He wondered if the man had really loved the girl, whether she too had money, and whether they would have had lots of children and been happy ever afterwards. And then he hurried out towards the sanatorium. I shall be late, he reflected. Such little, unimportant things delay one. End of A Bit of Wood by Algernon Blackwood